got a text message yesterday from Pastor Ryan out of the blue, and he doesn't usually text without any kind of a conversation going on, and all, this, all the text said was, we needed the rain. And I looked at my phone for like 10 minutes, I'm like, is this a code? <laughs> Am I supposed to know like the appropriate response to this? And I was like, no, we're just that old now. And, and, and reflecting on, <laughs> reflecting on starting in 2014 and Riley and Kid Nation and all of the stuff that we started, like it's, uh, um, yeah, sometimes you just feel old, right? Um, I have said a number of times, um, well, let me pause real quick and say good morning. <laughs> good, morning. Good, morning. Uh, good morning, church, and welcome to our neighbors. If we haven't met yet, my name is Michael, and I'm glad to be together with you. I've said a number of times, uh, and perhaps you have too, um, hindsight is 2020. Have, have, we, have we said that? Yeah? Uh, particularly when the year 2020 was what it was, and, and now that we're past it, we look back and go, oh, well, hindsight is 2020, and it's a little bit ironic um, that we have a clearer perspective on things after we've been through them, right? Um, we as hum- humans, I think, tend to prefer cause and effect. We, we like to see things that happen, and we like to know what was the reason why. Like, what, like this, is the, this is the effect, this is the thing that I'm experiencing in my life, and we dig down for deep meanings about why this happened. I get a, a random text message from Pastor Ryan. We needed the rain, and I'm like, why did he send this? What does, what does he want to communicate? And, and, and what he wanted to communicate was, man, we needed the rain. <laughs> like, we're, we're old men now, and we talk about the weather. Like, that's just, it's a Saturday afternoon, and that's what's on our mind. It's like, man, we needed the rain. We look for effects even, uh, we look for causes in, in like the most minuscule effects. And, and this chapter that we're going to look at together uh, in, in 1 Samuel, I think, is challenging because I'm looking for causes and effects and I'm not sure that I have absolute clarity about why the things happen in this chapters that happen or whether it's even good or bad. Like, have you, have you had a season in your life where you're like, hindsight's 2020, but I'm looking back and I'm reflecting and I'm not sure that I made the right call. I don't think the thing that I did was sin, but I'm also not sure that it was perfectly wise or I'm not sure that it was coming from a good motive, or, or I'm not sure that the outcomes that I got as a result of that were the things I was shooting for. Um, and, and sometimes, like, hindsight is a little bit more confusing, and that's the way that I'm feeling about this chapter. Um, as we've gone through this series, we've seen um, right at the beginning with David and Goliath that God gives us victory if we're fighting the right battles, when we're fighting the right battles. And as, as David's reputation has increased, um, Saul's reputation has decreased, and, and, and we acknowledge the fact that even our reputation in other people's eyes is measured out by God. He's the one that gives us favor in other people's eyes, for, for better or for worse. Uh, and, and Pastor Ryan, worst, well, sorry, <clears throat> for better or for worse. And Pastor Ryan shared with us last week uh, powerfully that the safest place to be is where Jesus called you to be, doing what Jesus called you to do. Um, and so we're going to take the next step in our series, uh, Sword and Spear. We'll, we'll, we'll actually revisit the sword and the spear today. I'm kind of excited about that. But as we begin, would you uh, pray together with me? It's our habit to pray together the disciples' prayer. Um, it's not a magic spell. Uh, we're not going to like uh, suddenly glow in the dark with holiness because we've prayed this prayer. But Jesus uh, said, hey, if you're going to follow me and walk with me, then pray this way, and I'm stupid enough to just do what Jesus said to do. So um, pray, uh, if you'd pray with me, you can pray out loud if you'd like to. The words are there on the screen, but at the very least, let's bow our hearts together and go before the Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Would you turn with me to 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 21 and 22 today. Um, we are going to cover most of these two chapters. It's on page 307 in the Blue Bibles. If you'd like to follow along in the Blue Bibles, page 307, uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And last week we saw um, that Saul's like private purpose of like, I'm going to put David in danger and put him in situations where he can be killed without me having to meddle. We saw that like all of that that was going on in his heart internally was then made public. And, and it was known to his family that he was actively trying to pursue David. Jonathan confirmed it. Um, and so now we've got to deal with the fact like David's been suspecting that he's not in a favorable position. But now it's out in the public. The king is actively trying to kill him in front of people in public. And it's a problem for him. So we open up in 1 Samuel chapter 21, uh, verse 1. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said, uh, Why are you alone and, and, and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know of anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? <laughs> Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, truly, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave them the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. We'll pause there. Um, we've got to deal with the matter of, of clean and unclean and specifically with bread. So David's on the run. Um, he ran first and hid in Ramah, which uh, was the place where Samuel uh, uh, made his base camp. So I think initially uh, in chapter 19, I think it was, uh, I don't have it written, 19 or 18, um, he, he went to Ramah to hide with Samuel, and Samuel is the prophet of the nation, and that's where, uh, where Jonathan discovered all this thing became public. Like, okay, maybe I can't hide among the prophets. Let me go to the priests. And so he goes to this small city named Nob, um, remember that uh, this is before the temple has been constructed, and so uh, the, the tabernacle is where God's presence is dwelling, and so it's a movable tent. If you, like, you could go to, uh, you could put the tent, set the tent up anywhere that you wanted, and right now it seems like the tabernacle is in this city of Nob, because that's where the, the pri priests are. I want to make sure I'm using the right P word. The priests are at Nob with the tabernacle, and so now David's trying to hide with the priests. And, and the priest is like, you're alone, but you're not alone. Like, he, he clearly is showing up, and something is obviously off, because the priest is like, why are you here alone? And he's got a couple of guys with him, but it's clear that this isn't like a normal, that he's not walking around the way he normally would. Maybe there were usually courtiers that would, that would go and announce, like, here comes the emissary of David, or here comes the emissary of the king, David. And, and there were banners and flags. And maybe it's not like that. Maybe it's just like five or six guys show up and say, hey, uh, what do you got to eat? <laughs> you know, um, they didn't call ahead of time. They're just kind of showing up. So the priest is nervous. He's like, why are you, why are you here? Like, what, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm on a secret mission. I'm on a secret mission. I can't tell you. Like, do you have anything to eat around here? And so that's where we have the conversation about uh, clean and unclean. In the tabernacle, this, um, oh, man. There's a lot of rules in the tabernacle because God's holiness requires us to come to him um, with, uh, with reverence and respect. In the same way, uh, if you were to think, and this is a real crass analogy, I don't know that I'm uh, completely lined up on the theology of it, but it'll give you a picture of what it is. Um, if we consider the presence of God to be a, a, a uranium power core, like the, the power of the people of Israel is the holy presence of God. 
then the, 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 the system around that needs to be specialized and containment. Like if we just let the presence of God out everywhere, it's actually going to burn everybody up. But if we can live in proximity to it, um, then we can use that to, you know, power houses, things like that. It's a crass analogy, but it's the same kind of deal where you don't go into a nuclear power plant without the right kind of clothes. And one of the things that, um, that they would put in there is they'd put what they call the bread of the presence. So every week they would bake fresh bread and they would put it in there. And there were 12 loaves to represent the 12 tribes of Israel as just a sign of like, hey, we're here and, and we're, we come to you for our, our sustenance. Um, and so as David comes in, they have just taken the, the old, the week old bread off of the tabern or off of the table of show bread, they called it. And they put fresh bread on there. So David says, hey, what do you have to eat? He says, I don't really have anything to eat. I wasn't expecting company. Like, you guys are just kind of dropping in. But we did just swap out the bread. If you guys are clean, you can eat it. Although, typically, this bread, the priests would eat and consume rather than just throw it away. Uh, the priests would, would get to eat this bread. But the priest also has the authority to get to say who gets to eat it. And if they are uh, ritually clean... Um, then they're, they're, the priest is saying you can, you can eat of it. And the way he, like, litmus tests this is, that have you guys been, like, you have girls with you? Like, you guys are a raiding party, your army. Like, have you been hanging out with girls? And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't get distracted when we're on tour. Um, and so we never keep girls around. And so the guys are clean. Like, it's cool. Like, okay, cool. Then you can have this bread. It's a strange story, right? Especially for us because we're like three or four steps removed from functioning in the tabernacle system. Like who thought, I mean, I know, I know you guys are accepted, but who thought to bring bread to church this morning? Like none of us. Like you guys got it. So you guys are ahead. And this is like you guys can eat this bread. Um, but that's not typically how we think about uh, not typically how we think approaching the presence of God. Like bread is not a thing that we think about. Maybe if we're considering a communion Sunday um, or, or taking the bread and the cup, we'll think about it that way. Um, but most of the time, not as much. And it's, it's kind of a strange story. And I think what it highlights is the fact that, that David's kind of in a desperate situation. And, and, and you could kind of look at the priests of Nob and be like, um, or Ahimelech and be like, well, why are you just kind of giving this bread out willy-nilly? Like, it seems like you should, you know, be more protective with it. But Jesus is going to reference this story in Matthew chapter 12 to show that human life is actually more important than bread. Like, he says, if you're going to, if you're going to make a decision to preserve human life, then, then, then do that. Like, like hum, human life is more important than uh, some, of the, some of the rules and regulations that, that you have kind of clung to. Um, and we could spend a whole sermon unpacking all of that. But here's the question uh, I think uh, that we can wrestle with here. Where do we see God's unexpected provision this week? Where do we see God's unexpected provision this week? Where, where has God, like, where have you just kind of assumed, like, oh, I'm going to have to handle this, and, like, you turn around, and suddenly it's just taken care of. It's there. Here, Here's the reason why I want to like hammer down on the things that we didn't expect. Because I think David's really just trying to mitigate his circumstances here. He's not entirely honest with Ahimelech, which is strange because he went to hide with the priests, and it, I, presumably he told Samuel what was going on, or you would assume he would tell Samuel what was going on because Samuel knew Saul and knew all the backstory. Like you'd think he would do that, and he doesn't. He kind of is keeping it to himself, and now he's going to the priest, and he's not telling the priest about what's actually going on. He just says, hey, I'm on a, I'm on a secret mission. Like, can you just give me something so I can get out of here? He's not, he's not expecting for God to take care of him in this situation. He's just trying to mitigate it, so he's, he's hiding details. And so where have we kind of been in our own corners trying to maybe uh, fabricate a wall in our own kingdom and, and just not expected God to show up, but he's showed up and been gracious anyway? Where do we see God's unexpected provision this week? I think I've got another picture, but I'll skip to our big idea for the morning, that our weakness, our weakness, does not stop God from caring for us. Our weakness does not stop God from caring for us. Let's continue reading. Because we've got a little bit of a, a plot thickening here in verse 7. Now, 
A certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doag, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There's none like that. Give it to me. Okay? So, this audience that's going on here is, is not completely isolated. There's a guy there who is a servant of Saul. He's the chief of Saul's herdsmen, um, and he is d- detained before the Lord. So it seems like he came to the tabernacle to try to get some counsel, some advice from God about whatever official business he was on. And he was either like the chief of the shepherds of Saul or... Um, Actually, in the ancient Near East, this is a common title for somebody who's like in the bureaucracy. Like chief of the herdsmen is is like a a legal title of, it wouldn't be like governor, but it's somebody who's like in the bureaucracy of the government. Um, And so he's there and he's watching this this take place, Um, which doesn't matter much for right now, but he's going to play an important role in a couple of minutes. Um, and David said, hey, do you, do you have like a weapon or something? Because I left so quickly that I didn't have, um, I didn't have time to, to get my armor or to get my sword. And so, you, you understand, this is all in haste. So like, do you have anything around? He's like, well, we've got Goliath's sword. <laughs> like, remember, remember him? Like, yeah, I remember him. Um, oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, we've got Goliath's sword. Like, you can have that because I'm a priest. I don't have use for a sword like somebody just wrapped it up and stuck it here in the tabernacle because we felt like um you know you had victory over the philistines so we took this kind of this relic thing and we stuck it here for safekeeping and so like you can have it because i'm not going to use it he's like great i'll take it but this is frustrating to me because where did we start this series in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where, where this, this young guy uh, is watching the armies of Israel cower before this, this Goliath guy who's just mocking the God of Israel and saying, like, I clearly can defeat any of you in single-hand combat. And this, and this, this young boy walks out on the field and, and, and says to a guy who's at least twice as tall as him, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. And yet he walks into the priest's house. He walks into the tabernacle and says, do you have a sword or a spear that maybe I could be saved by? I'm, I'm being a little bit dishonest. Like I told you, I'm on a king's errand and I guess I could like justify that white lie, but like what if God doesn't take care of me here? Do you have something with which I can protect myself? And, and the, the, the man who knew just four chapters ago that the Lord does not save by sword and spear actively seeks a sword or a spear. Give me something that I can rely on. The greatest test of our doctrine is how we live when put under pressure. The greatest test of our doctrine, our theology, the things that we know is how we actually live when we get put under pressure. I had a a professor um, who used to, he had a, a parable that I love a lot. I hate tea, but I love this parable. He says, students are like tea bags. He'd always say this before a test. He'd, and he had the worst tests ever. Like he'd, he'd give you a list of 20 questions. He says, I'm going to ask you two questions. And like you just have a blank sheet of paper, write as much as you can to answer the question. So I'll give you 20 questions. I'm only going to ask you two, but you don't know which two they are. So he'd be like, before a test, he'd be like, listen, students are like tea bags. You don't know what's in them until you put them in hot water. And the greatest test of our doctrine is how we live when put under pressure. 
It's, it's, it's great that we can, we can say and put it up on the wall that we hold God's gifts with open hands, but when, when the check that we were expecting didn't come through, we're like, should I be generous? I'm not sure. It's, it's one thing to know that we ought to love our neighbor, but when they're like actively attacking us and pose a threat to our family, like are we, I'm not sure. The greatest test of our doctrine is how we live when we put under pressure. We can know that God so loved the world without exclusion that he gave his only son. But when they don't quite agree with me about the things that I believe are true, like can I actually love them and lay my life down for other people? The greatest test of our doctrine is how we live when we're put under pressure. And I'm, I'm, I know David knows the answer because he was yelling it across the battlefield at a giant. The Lord saves not with sword and spear, but now he's got Saul on his tail actively and publicly trying to eliminate him. He says, you got a, you got a sword or a spear around? And I'd be mad at him if I didn't see myself in that picture. There have been times where we, we look back at um, victories or we look back at, at, at markers or places that we've been in the past and then we take those things and, and just, just cling to the past instead of looking to God for, for, for daily bread. It's, is that God, I, like, can you just do the thing that you did for me 10 years ago so that I don't have to trust you for whatever new thing it is you're trying to do today? Can you, can you just show me, like, I just want, let me pull that sword out of, the, out of the closet. Let me dust it off. I knew how to use this. These answers were helpful to me then instead of asking God, like, what, what will you use me for today? What relics may be distracting us from trusting God today. My hope is that it's not true of you, but I run into our neighbors. Say, hey, like, what's your relationship with Jesus like? Oh, I, I'm saved. I walked the aisle when I was eight. Okay, <laughs> that's not what I asked. Like, how, how are you walking with Jesus today? Oh, yeah, you know, we went to church like 15 years ago. Cool, his mercies are new every morning. Like, what, what are you, how are you walking with Jesus? Like, what's your spiritual life like? Like, I don't know. We, I pray sometimes when, like, I need a parking spot or something. And I'm concerned that we might have a stack of relics in our closet that we put more faith in, writing a date in the back of our Bible that a pastor handed to us when we were 10, than we do in his mercies that are new this day. And that we're going to walk and trust him today. And that we're going to serve and love him today. What relics may be distracted? And they could be good things. They could be great victories, awesome trophies of things that God has done in the past. But if we're so fixated on what God did that we're not looking at what he's doing today, then we might be missing it. Jesus answered Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. But praise be to God that our weakness does not stop God from caring for us. Let me show you a map. Um, maps are actually super helpful because we're not familiar with this. So you've got the Mediterranean Sea up there, the Dead Sea. And, and this, is, this is what's going on in this chapter. So you've got uh, Gibeah, which is Saul's capital city. Um, and it says Jerusalem on there, which is, is nice, I guess, so we know what it is. But like at this time, it's not called Jerusalem. It's called Jebus because it's the capital city of the Jebusites. So it's a Canaanite city. It, it's not actually in Israel. Uh, occupation yet. Second Samuel make a big deal about David capturing Jebus and making it his capital city. But we're not even there yet. So we've got Gibeah as the capital city, which is where Saul's like kind of publicly declaring. Uh, David runs up to Ramah and then he runs down to Nob. 
Um, and then what he does next, which I don't understand, is he goes to Gath. He picks up the Saul of Goli- or he picks up the sword of Goliath, the giant of Gath, and then makes a beeline to Gath, and then is surprised that they're like, "Yo, he's got Goliath's sword. He's back here. Like, he's here." He's like, oh, they're not welcoming me here. Like, I thought I could maybe find some refuge with the Philistines because obviously I don't have an ally in in the king of Israel, so I'll go to the Philistines. And they're like, dude, uh, David's here, and he's the king of Israel, which I think is interesting. Like, the Philistines think that he has the reputation of being the king already, but he doesn't. The the king of Israel's here, and he's got just a couple of guys with him, and and so David ends up acting like he's a lunatic. He acts crazy because they had a superstition at the time that if you were kind of crazy, if you were a little bit loopy, that you'd been touched by God and, and so they couldn't kill you, but they wouldn't necessarily like hang out with you. <clears throat> so he acts crazy and they, he escapes Gath and he runs over to a, a cave in Adullam. And as he's there in Adullam, he's got people uh, here where he's at and he's got four, it says 400 people who were just kind of like broken or destitute or, or desperate, like these, these people kind of come around and, and he builds an army of, of the least of these, really. And while he's there, he gets, he gets word that Saul's after him, of course, so he takes his mom and his dad and he, he takes them over to Moab and hides them in a different country for a little bit, which is interesting to me, but his great-grandma Ruth was from Moab, so maybe he's got a home there. He's just, he's on the run. Like, he, he, he's unsettled. But our weakness does not stop God from caring for us. Let's read together in chapter 22, in verse 6. Meanwhile, at Gibeah, now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear me now, people of Benjamin. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then answered Doeg, the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul, uh, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to uh, Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. <laughs> then the king sent to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law and and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you in all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. I'll pause there. We're not done. Don't read ahead. We're not, I'm pausing. I'm pausing. All right? I know you want to know how it ends. <clears throat> um, it's interesting. Saul has, 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 has just so wrapped himself up as being like the victim that every movement is, is, is seen as a threat. 
Like David is literally like hiding from him. And Saul's looking at David in hiding going, he's letting an ambush for me. And he looks at all of his trusted servants. He says, look, he can't even bring himself to say his name. Listen, the son of Jesse is not a Benjamite like I am. We're not of the same family. Is he going to give you the same benefits when he becomes king? Is he going to give you land? Is he going to give you positions in his government? Like you're of Benjamin and he's of Judah. Like, like y'all are from different families. You're, you, you should not expect to get promotions from him. So why are you hiding him? He turns against the people who trust him and says, you guys are all conspiring against me too. But Doag, <laughs> Doag the Edomite, which is interesting because he's, he's clearly in Saul's service and he's, he's clearly in the government of Israel and yet his title is Doag the Edomite. And Edom is not Israel. Edom is actually uh, descended from another, another uh, Canaanite group. So he's a guy who probably shouldn't be in upper government as it is if we're going to like honor the Lord. And, and, and Doag's like, well, hey, I was, I was up at the tabernacle and I saw, I saw the priests take care of David, and they gave him bread, and they gave him the sword of Goliath. The sword of Goliath? He's got the sword of Goliath now? So he says to Ahimelech, like, what are you doing, man? And Ahimelech says, I didn't do anything that I haven't done before. Like, why would I be suspicious of David? Who is more respected in your house than David? He's your son-in-law. And is this the first time that I've ever like, asked of God for him? Like, no, I've done it before. And if there's a plot, don't lump me into this. I didn't know anything about it. And he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth because David lied to him. He asked the questions, why are you here? Like, oh, it's a secret mission. Like, okay. And, and, and sometimes you just gotta take people at their word, especially if they're like, Reliable, generally. So Ahitub says, or son of Ahitub says, look, I didn't, I didn't do this willingly. Like, if I've been duped, I've been duped, but don't hold it against me. And Saul says, it's not enough. You're going to die. And he turns to his guards and says, you guys kill him. I'm like, um, killing, killing priests? Like, we're warriors. We, we'll, we'll hack up an army. Somebody coming at me with a sword? Like, I'm not going to flinch, but priests like they gave up the only sword they had between a lot of them like they're not a threat verse 18 then the king said to Doeg you turn and strike the priests and Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod and Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep, he put to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safekeeping. So Doeg is clearly gunning for a promotion here. All the guard, the guys whose job it is to actually hack somebody up, um, they're like, nah, like, that's not what we're here to do. And Doeg's like, I got a shot. The guy in charge has given me a special assignment, and I can do it. And if the king tells me to do it, it's right, right? And if you're like me, I'm thinking, like, maybe there's three or four priests, like, in my head. That's what I'm thinking. How many did he hack up? Eighty-five. And then turns against the city itself and kills women and children and oxes and donkeys which is astonishing considering the very thing that Saul was removed, like the, the anointing for kingship was on Saul, like 
God had told him specifically, I want you to devote this city and all of its people and all of its cattle to destruction. And Saul was like, no, I'll just keep a couple sheep for myself. It's cool. So like Saul, Saul got in trouble. Like the whole reason we're on this trajectory at all is because Saul did not exact that kind of uh, uh, precision in executing everybody in the town. But here, not when it's a threat to Israel or when it's a threat to God's reputation, he's not willing to do it. But when it's a threat to his own throne, you better believe I'm going to drop the hammer. You better believe everybody's going to know I'm going to send a message here. And Doag sees an opportunity. It's going to be an easy fight. There's another layer that's really unsettling to me. It's clear that none of these priests were guilty. Like they were not conspiring against Saul. Like this is clearly an absolute evil that happened. And yet, this family is descended from a guy who we were briefly introduced to uh, when we were in the prayer stories for a minute. Um, do you remember Eli, the priest who heard Hannah's prayer and thought she was drunk? Like, him and his kids had about the same spiritual perception. They were not great priests. And, and God comes to Eli and says, if you don't do something about your boys, if you don't take them out of the priestly office, then I'm going to take the priesthood from you, and nobody in your family is going to be priests. And Eli was just like, okay, just can't argue with that. And so instead of actually doing the thing that God told him to do, he just accepted God's punishment. And so God has told Eli in, in the same book in 1 Samuel chapter 2 that none of his family is going to be priests. And so it's clear, it's clear that these guys didn't do anything wrong, but it's also clear like there's a different part of the story that's going on where God is, 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 is answering the thing that he said he was going to happen, where he's eliminating most of Eli's family in this thing. And, there's, and he said, even back in chapter 2, that only one person was going to escape the judgment. And so Abiathar escapes, but he's eventually going to conspire against David. It's a passive conspiracy. He lets some things happen. He lets things not go reported. Um, and then David's son Solomon is going to ex, uh, excommunicate him from the priesthood. So we're like in this weird ball of, of, of different things that are going on, and I want to say, like, I, my desire is to communicate clearly, but here's an instance where I'm looking back, I've got hindsight, and I'm, it's not 2020. It seems like God is using evil things to accomplish righteous purposes, and that's unsettling to me. And yet, I wonder, is there anything that's not possible for him? David wrote a psalm at this time. It was Psalm 52 that we read together. And it's all about, um, it starts off with, oh, you wicked man, like how dare you go against, uh, go against God and, and your, your, your lips are quick to utter lies and all you're concerned about is building up your own wealth and your own strength. And he closes that psalm with, I trust, I, but I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. And so I look at this story and I, I'm trying to grapple with the thread and I'm trying to understand like what, what's the cause and effect here? What am I supposed to learn? Like there's times where I just want to come to the Bible and I want to know what the moral of the story is. Who should I be like and who should I not be like? But it seems like nobody is doing the right thing here. And isn't God gracious that he doesn't sugarcoat the fact that we're jacked up? And yet our weakness does not stop God from caring for us. David's going to, like this, this event, this, his decisions in these chapters are going to play out again and again for the next 10 years of his life. But I don't know if it's cause and effect. I don't know if it's because he picked up Goliath's sword that now he's got to run around for 10 years. Like I, don't, I, I just don't know. 
And that feels a whole lot more like my Wednesday. So then, how are we trusting Jesus this week and not in our own strength? What are the relics that we're pulling out of the closet? What are the, what are the circumstances we're trying to mitigate and, and the people we're trying to manipulate so that we can be in a situation to do the thing that we think is actually what we're going to do instead of just coming to Jesus and saying, look, I, I got no idea. Like, if, if left to my own, my internal compass is spinning in circles and I'm not sure which way to go, but Lord, like, you say you'll guide and direct me. Like, help me to lay down my life and my trust in you. And that looks like honesty. That looks like when somebody asks you, hey, why are you alone? That we don't come up with some kind of excuse about how, you know, we're just taking some time away from the community because we need to sort our own stuff out. Like, maybe just say, I, I'm, I'm questioning God and I don't think I can trust him. And the people that were walking and helping me follow God before, like, they hurt me and so I don't think I can trust them either. Like maybe, maybe trusting Jesus this week is, is, is about honesty rather than just a, a little lie to make it more palpable. Maybe it looks like patience. Maybe it looks like instead of, instead of trying to force your way into something that you think God has, just waiting. Instead of being in a hurry to get away from the threat to just trust that God, you guide my steps. Maybe it looks like humility to just say, I don't have the answers, and I don't think that 2020 is going to give me any more perspective. That, or 2020. I don't think that hindsight is going to give me any more perspective. And so, Lord, would you help me in these moments, give me this day, my daily bread, the only thing I need for today, would you help me to serve you well in these hours, in these moments, with these people at this time, in this place, Help me not to be so distracted by all the things that could be or should be or would be or could have been or should have been or would have been, but what are you doing in me in this moment now? How can I walk with you? How can I cling to you and walk in step with you instead of trying to wrestle my own lassos around your legs so that you'll walk in step with me? but our weakness does not stop God from caring for us. Even if we're in the pit, even if we're in the valley of the shadow of death, he's there with us. And even in our moments of weakness where we're reaching for the sword, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. So let's turn to him. Lord Jesus, you're the God of the black and the white. You're the God of the gray. I, I sometimes come to you and I wish that you'd just written a textbook with formulas and answers and causes and effects that are real clear to understand. And that's not what you left for us. You left us these stories that are hard to sit with, hard to sit on, difficult to chew. And maybe you've done that so that we might not just settle for the black and white of the book, but that we might come to you in the midst of the book that your spirit may guide us for this day. Almighty God, the creator of heaven and of earth, would you be attentive to us? just in these brief moments, not because we're righteous and we've got it all together and we've figured out the right formula, but simply because we know that we're broken and we're coming to you and asking for your assistance, not just your assistance, your correction, that you would give us your true and full life. That we can't fabricate it on our own. Would you help us to trust you enough to be honest with one another? Would you help us to trust you enough to know that you are not the one who wins victories by sword and spear. Would you restore to us the joy of our salvation? It's in your name that we pray. Amen.